Romans chapter 9, we're going to go to that very tough verse. Not that Jacob I love, Esau I hate it. We're not going to go there. We're going to go down to uh, verse 22, I believe it is. Verse 22, Romans 9. Look at verse, yeah, yeah, verse 22. Come on, stand on your feet, please, man. Sir, so we can read God's word together. We're going to be open, be open, be open. What I'm sharing this morning is those who are in Bible study kind of know where I'm going or kind of understand, the, they'll know the background. But for those others, just be open, be open. Romans 9 verse 22. What if God... Wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath pre -prepared, prepared for destruction, and that he may make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. God, we honor you. God, now we look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who sustains us, the one who keeps us and upholds us by your word alone and your grace. That God, now that you would give us a grace to understand this text, to understand, God, your, your, your plan and your glory. God, that we can walk out of here feeling all the more um, honored and pleased to be in your elect this i ask in jesus name amen you may be seated thank you i want to use for a title this morning the supremacy of the glory and plan of god the supremacy of the glory and plan of God. So on the heels or the, the, the after effect of the whole Trayvon Martin and Zimmerman case, you know, this the verdict came out what weekend, last weekend, I think it was last weekend it was. And the whole week, you know, it was all about at least on the black radio stations, it was all about this, this trial and how it felt. How, how do you feel about this? Was it this? Was it that? You know, was it a, a racial thing or was it not? So as I began to listen to all this throughout the week and just kind of understand, I quickly heard the Spirit saying, don't get caught up in what you hear the media talking about. Don't get caught up in what you hear your fellow black co-workers say. Don't get caught up in what you hear. Um, what's the guy that spoke at the NAACP and some of the other um, activists, if you will. Don't get caught up in what you hear this world say about everything that went down with the Zimmerman case, the Trayvon Martin case. So as I began to hear that, I began to dig into that and say, okay, God, I have a few questions then. Where do you stand in all this? I believe, God, that you are in the midst of it all and that you are aware of it, didn't catch you off guard, but God, God I asked the question, God, where do you stand in all this? That's what, I, that's what Cornelius Simon wants to know. And it took me back to Romans chapter 9. You see, you have to understand that God has a, God has a special people reserved for himself. Scholars would call it the elect. Those who are, who've been beforehand 
as we read in our verse this morning, prepare beforehand to be vessels of honor to his glory. So I think what we need to have, at least start to consider, this is a more maybe of a food for thought type of message that I want to share with you, that we need to have a Christian perspective on not just the Zimmerman Martin case, but also anything else that may come up that you may look at and say, wow, how is all of this happening? Or why is all of this happening? And where is God and all that? One of the things I meant to do, didn't get a chance to do it, was this morning to go online or either go out to the, uh, to the store and get a newspaper and start cutting out all the articles of all the bad things that are happening in this country. And you know it, you don't have to go too far into the paper to find that out. You can just turn on the news. Sunday morning, I think ABC is the only one really carrying news around 8 o'clock hour, ABC News, WSTB, and just hear of all of the bad stuff that is happening in our country alone, in our city alone. Let's not even look Atlanta, in the metropolitan Atlanta area. So when you begin to see things like that, maybe in your quiet time or maybe when the spirit pricks your heart, you begin to ask the question, God, where do you stand in all this heinous crime, all this heinous sin that is happening? And if we are not careful, we will find ourselves having the same opinion of the matter as the world does. But the scripture reminds us that though we are in the world, we are not of this world. So if we're not of this world, then we must have a different perspective about the things that are going on around us. Not to mention, not to mention, family, consider this, not to mention that we live in a fallen world. Sin entered in through Adam and Eve, and now we live, a, uh, we, live, we live in a world as a byproduct of the sin that happened back in the garden. So you always got to consider that we live in a sinful world, and when there is sin, then there is bad things that's going to happen. So we must have a different perspective. We have been given, listen, we have been given the spirit, believers have been given the spirit of God and the spirit of God leads us into all truth. So steady considering what the media say, we should be saying, God, give us the truth. Lead us into the truth of what's happening in our world. Lead us into the truth of what's going on around us. Lead us into the truth and why this is happening and why that is happening. We also have the Spirit of God, which gives us, uh, uh, it reveals to us deep things about God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or 2, I think it is. The Spirit of God knows, it, it searches the deep in God, and because we have the Spirit of God, then we have now access, if we ask for it, and as, as God will grant it to us, we have asked to, access to understand to a degree of what's going on in our world. But if we only listen to the media, if we only listen to what the world says and how the world, how our coworkers talk about things, then we'll get caught up in that same thing, and we'll miss God, and if we miss God, then we miss our opportunity to, to be to be what God has called us to be, messengers. Just understanding, just having a slightly different perspective about things can cause you to think differently and to act differently about what just happened, about what you might have saw on the news. So, the supremacy of the glory of God and the supremacy of the plan of God. Let me give you a definition. Supremacy means the state or condition of being superior to all others in authority, power, or status. You ever heard that? I'm wondering, that's not right. I don't want to find another supremacy. Like some countries think they're more supreme than other countries, or some people groups. I don't want to say that phrase. You know what I'm talking about. Back in the 70s, 60s, whatever. You know what I'm talking about, that phrase. That people group or that country thinks themselves to be superior 
to all others, to every country out there. They're more superior. They think they're more superior than this country and that country. They, they, have, they, they find themselves to be more superior in authority, power, or status. So supreme means the word supreme. So it's a state or condition of being superior or being more supreme. And supreme means the greatest in power, authority, or rank. Just the word supreme. It could also mean greatest in degree, significance, or character. Supreme. The highest above anything else. One who thinks they are supreme or they think their organization is supreme, they're saying that we are better or the greatest than anything else out there. It's highest above all. So when I speak about the supremacy of the glory and the plan of God, I am speaking about that God, the state and the condition of God is superior to all other authority, powers, and status or our status. So when you hear that word supreme or you hear the word great as in Psalm 47 too, for the Lord most high is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. You can say he's supreme over all the earth. When you hear it in Psalm 48, 1, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Supreme is the Lord. And he is above all things. And we praise him. So we see God. And scripture presents God as being one who is supreme. He is the one true God. Higher above any other God, little g, that may exist, that you may conjure up in your mind. God is supreme. And not only is God supreme, but God's glory is supreme. So think about this. If God's glory is supreme, and if the word supreme means the greatest of everything else, over all things, that means that the glory of man, or I should say, God's glory trumps the glory of man. God's uh, uh, plan trumps the plan of man. So when I speak of the supremacy now, think about everything I'm saying, family, in the context of Romans 9, 22, 23. What if God wanted to show, here's my paraphrase, what if God wanted to show the vessels of honor, his mercy, his love, his grace, chose, chose others for destruction that his elect can see his goodness. So his elect can see his grace. So his elect can see his mercy. How can God be displayed as such as this, that, or the other is there is not a opposite or something contrary to that? God cannot be seen as a, the most supreme loving God if there is not one who loves, who tries to love as God. He has to be seen as the supreme loving God. How can God's goodness be seen if everything in the world is good? You can't see it. And this is something that we learned in Romans, in our Bible study uh, these past weeks, that when we look at, the, 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 at God and his sovereignty, right. and we look at God and his supremacy, one must have something to compare it to in order to be supreme. It can't, you cannot have a supremacy if they're all on the same level. So let me give you four or five, five things, family, in how the glory of God is supreme. First, the glory of God is supreme in his love or by his love. When we speak of God's glory or the glory of God, we're speaking of everything that makes up, makes him up. His beauty, his majesty, his power, his love, his mercy. All that wrapped up together is, is our, our attributes of God's glory. So God's glory 
can be seen as supreme because of God's love. John 15, 13 says, no greater love has a man than this, than to lay down one's life for another. And who life did he lay down for another? Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave, that he calls or decreed and planned, family planned, that his only begotten son would die on a cross. A shameful death by man's standards. He was spat on. He was flogged, frog flogged. He was beaten. He was ridiculed. All of this, and the word of God will tell us in the book of Isaiah that he will stand there and take it. Why? Because of God's, the supremacy of God's glory and the supremacy of God's plan. When Jesus was on his way, the garden gets to me. He said, he says, God, if this, if this cup can pass, God, let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy plan be done. God, I know that I was equal with you in from all eternity, and I'm down here now, God, but I understand that, God, that your plan is supreme above my plan. The supremacy of God's glory and the supremacy of the plan of God, family, will always stand. So we see things happen out there in this world, in this country. We must consider, family, first and foremost, the supremacy of God's plan. Where we might have thought where some might have thought that Zimmerman should have been convicted, the supremacy of God's plan says, no, he should not have been convicted. And I think, Booker, you said on Wednesday that both families prayed for justice to be done. And justice, so if they're both praying to the same God that justice be done, and he got off, or he was not, I don't say he got off, and he was not convicted, then should we not say then that God justice was done? But see, if you allow the world's way of thinking about things, especially us black folks, then we will get caught up in this whole racial thing when from a Christian Take perspective, a Christian this perspective is not even about and look at it differently. We won't see this as a white Hispanic, because it wasn't a white, a white Hispanic versus black. We can see it as, what is God doing in this? His plan is supreme, and we must understand this as we look at this from a Christian lens, is that, okay, God, your plan is, is supreme, the end of the plan, so surely there's something going on in the midst of this that we are not aware of, but we have the privilege to ask God for, and he'll give it to us as he sees it. So, 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 <laughs> God's glory is supreme because of his love. First John 4, 8 says, God is love. All of who God is, everything that he is made of, every substance about him is love. So because he is love, then he is supreme. His love makes his glory supreme. Second, second thing, family, why the glory of God is supreme is because of his grace. I won't spend much time on that because I mentioned that earlier through my exhortation. Because of God's grace. Grace, family, is defined as undeserved favor with no repayment in demand. Man is not going to give you that kind of grace. You may not sense that in the beginning, but soon or later, hey, remember I did this for you? Hey, you know, can you? Can I, you know, can you help the brother out? I'll help you out, you know, last year. Can, can, you know, can I get a hookup? You know, you know, you know God is God, God's, God's grace is his undeserved. First of all, un, look at that word undeserved. Man's going to judge you first. Should I give that to him? What they do for me lately? What have you done for me lately? But God says, you, you. You don't deserve it. I don't care what you did or did not do for me lately. I'm going to give you this grace because of my glory. <laughs> it's all about God's glory. God said I would give my glory to no one. God wants a glory. And if God got to give you all 
heathen Christians, oxymoron, are, if you got to give your old stiff neck Christians some grace, he will do so because of his glory, so he can get the glory. So, so God's, God's, God, God is supreme because of his grace. He's thoroughly, thoroughly family. God is supreme because of his mercy. His mercy. I may forgive you. Mm, how many times you did that to me? I mean, forgive me this time. You get no more mercy from me. But not God. His mercies are new every morning. The psalmist says in Psalm 136, 1, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endureth forever. No matter what you got going on in your life, God's mercy endures forever. They are new every morning. And because of God's unconditional uh, uh, giving or bestowment of his mercy, it makes him supreme to any other power, status, or authority. He is supreme. God, mercy flows from his goodness. God in him, in his character, in his nature is, uh, is goodness. In him is love. And because in him is goodness, then goodness, mercy flows from goodness. If you are overall, all around good person, you're going to want to do, you're going to want to forgive people, right? Because good is in you. You know, God, good, God is, a, is a good God, right? God is good all the time. And what flows from his goodness? Mercy. And because that God is good all the time and all the time God is good, then it makes him supreme over any other power, authority. His character is the greatest above anything else because he is good. The substance of him is good. All right. God's mercy is tender and it's far-reaching. It's great. And it's everlasting. He, he'll deal with you tenderly. Love me tender. You know that song, Love Me Tender? He'll deal with you tenderly. You're not going to beat you upside the head. Here's my mercy. He'll bring you in and deal with you tenderly, knowing that you've been bruised or knowing that you're struggling with this, that, or the other. And he'll deal with you tenderly. He'll give you his mercy. Number four, God, or the glory of God is supreme because of his omnipotence. Psalm 62, 11, all power belongs to God. God has all power. And remember the definition, family, of supremacy. For one to be supreme, it has to be the greatest above anything else. So if I read in the scripture that all A-L-L power belongs to God, then that tells me that God then in his omnipotence or in his power is supreme. I'm going somewhere. Bear with me. I'm going somewhere. Fifth thing, fifth and final in this section here. God is omniscient. He is supreme. Because he knows everything. Remember the definition. The greatest above anything else, everything else. He is supreme because he knows everything. I, I'm sorry, you know, you can't go down to, 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 to whatever figure, male figure, man, I'm sorry, man figure that you think of, human man figure, and, and they don't know everything. Your husband and your wife don't know everything. Your mama and your daddy don't know everything. They can lead you around. They are not supreme, family. Only God is supreme because of his omnipotence, because of his omniscience, because of his grace, his love, and his mercy. The supremacy of the glory of God. Turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. <sighs> I want to get you thinking. We're going to go back to Romans 9, but I want to get you thinking. Colossians 1. I want to show you a word in here that means the same as this supremacy. 
Look at verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and all the, and in him all things consist. Key verse, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, say all things, right. he may have the preeminence. Who has the NLT? What did the NLT say in that, in that last verse, verse 18? First, above, supremacy. He's, this is the God we serve. This is the God that we should be asking God what is going on, not man. We want to know what the heck is going on in the world. We need to go to God and say, God, you know all things. You are supreme in everything, God. So you have the ability, the knowledge to tell us everything that is going on or why these things are happening around us. Okay. The second session, the supremacy of the plan of God. So remember, remember, God, the glory of God is supreme. The word of God tells us in the Old Testament that he is a jealous God. I will give my glory to no one else. God will not allow his glory to be uh, afforded or usurped or covered up by some man's plan. God has a plan in Zimmerman and of the Martin case, and we as believers just say, okay, this is not about race, this is not about this, this is not even not about a 70-year-old guy, being, a boy being shoot. There's a bigger plan that we, if we really want to know, should ask God about. And I think one of the things I begin to see as I listen and look through this here, now this whole stand your ground law is being coming to more visibility now. Could it be family, I heard this in Bible study on Wednesday, could it be family that God uh, 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 allowed this to happen so that the stand your ground law could be looked at more carefully, not knowing or he knowing that if it's not, there's tons of more things that's going to happen in the days, months, years to come. The plan of God is supreme. And we need to understand that what we see as hateful and bad and all that's wrong to God, God is saying, yes, that might be wrong, but I have a larger picture in mind that they just don't know about. My ways are higher than their ways. My thoughts are higher than their thoughts. They just don't know. But if they ask me, I will tell them because they have my spirit within them. And they just stop listening to what the world says and what V103 says and 96.1 and Fox News and ABC News and CNN and Will and Grace and Grace, whatever her name is. Amen. Will and Grace, not Will and Grace. We don't want to go to them, do we? Nancy Grace, thank you, sister. I know she had Grace in her name. If we stop going to all those channels, Fox News, fair and balanced. And just go to God and say, God, fall on your knees and say, God, please share with me, God, what's going on. And tell me of my part in all of this. And God, who, who, who says, James 1, I think it is, somewhere in James. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. <laughs> so if you are enraged behind what happened and what you continue to hear, Turn the television off. Close AJC. Close Facebook. Because, Lord, they'd be having some opinions out there. And I'm saying to myself, where's the believers? Rise up, believers. Now, I'm stepping on my toes right now because I had a, a, a thought to go post some of this stuff I'm sharing now, but I didn't want to be accused of, you know, being whatever. So I just not put anything out there because I would have a controversial statement to say, look, this ain't about racism, ain't about that. Y'all need to look at it from a Christian perspective. Where's your Christian mindset about this whole thing? But I was scared, so I didn't do it. Yeah, you know, they, they can be brutal out there. 
They the haters, haters. They, the, they haters. They don't know. Look, look. I should have told myself, greater is he that is in me than is he that is in the Facebooks. Because I know, I know what my God told me. I went to my God and said, God, what is going on? And God said, this is not about a killing, family. It's bigger than that. All right, all right, let's get on to this. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off on that. The supremacy of the plan of God. So the question must be asked then, how is the plan of God supreme? I'm sorry, I see my notes here and I kind of know my thoughts from last night. First of all, note this. God's plan is supreme because he is the creator of it all. Come on, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created. He's the creator of it all. What, 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 what? Uh, the potter and the clay? Does, does, not the, does not the potter have right over the clay? Does not the one who formed the thing have the right over the thing? Oh, Romans 9 is good. Look, go, go back to Romans 9. Let me just go back to Romans 9. Oh, my goodness. I so love that chapter. We all know. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 21. Oh, go up to 20. Go up to 20. Come on, read it. I want you to see this in text. But indeed, O oh man, but indeed believers who are thinking like the world, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing form say to it, who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Why, who are we to say to God, God, why did you allow this to happen? God say, no, I am supreme. I know things that you can't even fathom. If I told you, you would probably go crazy if I told you the things that would happen. Now, y'all bear with me now. We were watching the Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn. Any y'all seen that? No, nobody seen it. Okay, you know the whole Twilight trilogy, whatever. So there's a portion. Listen, thank you, Holy Spirit. There's a portion in the movie when they're about to come to battle, the 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 good vampires and the or the peaceful vampires and the bad vampires. So they're about to go to battle, and then the one who has a, a the spirit of future can tell the future. She goes up to the one, the leader of the bad one. She holds his hand. She holds his hand. Now, granted, now. For about 20 minutes, this whole fight scene goes on. She's, she holds his hand, and then next you know, they're fighting. They're all fighting, killing each other, killing each other, killing each other. And then the, the leader, at, towards the end of the fight scene, the leader gets his head torn off. That's how they kill the vampire. They cut all the heads off. Kind of gory. Yeah, I know. Just follow me. Please follow me. Remember we talked about Romans 14 was allowable? You know all this stuff? Okay, don't judge me. <laughs> Because I know y'all, don't act like y'all be watching no PG-13 and stuff like that. Don't be looking at me all holy and stuff. Except for maybe a select few. Don't be acting like y'all don't be watching no, you know, you know, don't act like, don't act. Don't be judging me. Stop, don't tell you about nailing me to the cross. Don't be doing that. How you doing, Sister Dora? All right, so, so at the end of this fight scene, the man gets his head cut off. Now, mind you, the, 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 the lady who's holding his hand, is a, she tells the future. And she, the, the, the bad guy wants to go to war with the good, the peaceful vampires. So you're watching this whole fight scene, and then they come back to the scene where she's still holding his hand. As if to say, you, you, she, he show, she was showing him the future of what would happen if you go to war with us. And it was, it, he, he would end up dead. It was some head tearing off. My point I'm making, family is that God knows everything. That's right. God sees five years from now, and he knows what's going to go down. And so God says that I have to intervene. I have to cause or allow, permit this to happen, because I know what's going to happen here. I'm getting ahead of myself. I know what's going to happen here. So, so we must understand, family, that, that God is, I'm, I'm going to come back to this later. That his, he is, his plan is supreme because he's the creator of it all. Colossians, we just read that in Colossians 1, 16, that all things were created by him and through him. I like Psalm 89, 11. 
It says, heaven and earth are yours. The world and all its fullness. You founded them. God is the creator. And because God is the creator, then whatever he plans to be will stand because he is, or whatever he plans to be will come to pass because he's the creator, and that makes him supreme above anything else. All right, now, second point. Kind of go back to my story now. Second point, second point. How is that the plan of God is supreme? Number two, he knows the end from the beginning. That's what I was trying to get through the whole story. God knows the end from the beginning. See, the man in the movie, he, he, he saw what would happen if he go through with this thing here. So he said, well, we're not going to go to war. God says, I, 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 I know the end from the beginning. And because I know the end from the beginning, then I, I, my, my plan, I wrote the end from the beginning. And because I wrote the plan, because I am creator, then, I, then that makes me supreme above the court system. That makes me supreme above the prosecutor who later days, they were saying she made all kind of boo-boos. My goodness. God's plan is to be, and, and, and you know, you can go a step further and say, you know what? Because this is my position. God calls her to make those boo-boos. Verse 22 in Romans. I mean, verse 21. Who are you to say to the thing? Who are you as the thing to say to the one who made you, why did you make me this way? This trial could have been a whole different thing if X, Y, Z would have happened. But because God is the creator of it all. And because God knows the end from the beginning, he maybe allowed, now maybe he allowed certain steps to not happen properly so that justice can prevail. So that we can look at this stand your ground law and whatever other laws out there that surface as a result of this trial and this whole ordeal. Revelation 22, 13 would tell us that he being Christ, being God, is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end, the first and the last. God's plan, family, is supreme because of who he is, because he is creator, and because he is Alpha and Omega, because he encompasses everything from the start to the end. Number three. God's plan is supreme because he has the power to see his plans through. If God decree a thing, believe it that it will come to pass. Job says like this, chapter 42. God, my paraphrase here, I now know that you can do all things or that you can do everything. And that no purposes of yours can be withheld from you. This is the God that we serve. And this is the God that is supreme, that is the greatest of anything, any authority, any power, any status. And, and remember, remember what uh, uh, Abraham, uh, he tells Abraham, is there anything too hard for when he was going to, he told Sarah that she would have a baby and she owned oh, whatnot. Well, uh-uh. She in the, in the tent chuckling, <laughs> yeah. No, uh, no, no, no. Why is Sarah laughing? Don't she know? Don't y'all know that I can do anything that I want to do? God's plan is supreme because he and only he alone has the power to see all of his plans come through. That makes him supreme. That makes him greater or greater than any other power or authority out there. Proverbs 19, 21, what tells us that the Lord's counsel will stand. Fourth reason I give why the plan of God is supreme, because his plan is motivated by love. And that's how we got to think of things, family. We got to think of things, okay, what God is doing or what God is allowing, because God is, because God is love, right? 
if the substance of who you are is this, then only that's going to flow from you. Right? I, I can't take a, 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 a grape and make orange juice come out of it. It's not going to happen. The substance of that grape is grape juice. So grape juice is going to flow out of it. The substance of God is love. So anything God does is motivated by love. So when God decrees, permit, allow, something like what we are talking about, what we consider in our country, in our state to happen, we must understand and believe from a Christian perspective that God allows it, decrees it, because of love. What kind of man, man, human man, going to send their son to go die on a cross? Would you take your son, Brother Lester, and hang him up? You wouldn't. What kind of man would do that? Because God's love is, is, is perfect. It's complete. Then God can do that because his motivation is love. And because his motivation is love, it makes his plan supreme above any other plan. Man's plan sometimes is motivated by own selfish desires. And the Lord would tell us in Proverbs 16, Proverbs 16, that, that you know, a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And, you know, you know, commit your works unto the Lord, and then your thoughts will be established. So God's plan, family, is motivated by love. When he sent the Israelites into captivity in Babylon, and I think of the scripture, Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you. His plan, family, is plans of love. But he had to allow them to go into captivity to teach them a lesson. But ultimately, he did it because he loved them. And he gives them the reassurance that the plans I have for you is a plan of good, not to do evil to you. God does not mean evil for us. God does not mean for evil to happen to us. But we must understand that God allow certain evils to happen because of the love he had, not just for a family, but for the world, especially his elect. One more point to this and I'm done. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go, here we go. God's plan is supreme, family, because good is always the end. Whatever God ordains, Whatever God uh, brings into being by way of his plan or his counsel or his will, understand this, that good is the end result of it. Whether you see it, acknowledge it, accept it or not, it is good. For I know that all things work together for the, of those who love God and call according to purpose. No matter what's going on, no matter what trial or suffering you're in, good is at the end of that. Count it all joy when you fall into because knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. And when patience has a perfect work, you'll be complete and lacking nothing. Peter would say it like this in 5.10. During suffering and trials, the grace of God will perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you. Good is at the end. No matter what you're going through, like, no matter what we see out here, we must understand God's plan is supreme because God has good as the end result of it. Now, you take man's plan. Man's plan is not always, most time, don't end with good. Maybe good for man, but not good for the whole being. All right. All right, go back to Romans 9. With everything I said here this morning, family, and we look at verse 22 and 23 again. Consider the supremacy of the glory of God. Consider the supremacy of the plan of God. Now read verse 22. What if God wanted to show his wrath and to make his power known, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, prepare for destruction, and that he may make known the riches of his glory? It's all about the glory, family on the vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Because God has in his mind the vessels of honor, he, in this scripture word, prepares 
certain things, family, it may be hard to, to grasp this concept. I think we wrestled with this in our Bible study. So please, if you have any questions, please, 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 don't walk away, ask, ask the questions, email me, whatever, ask me some questions about this. But in God's supreme plan and wisdom for his glory, family, he allows certain things to be. And I will go as far as to say that he does his first and foremost for his elect, his special people, his chosen generation, his vessels of honor. The word of God would tell us, I think it's in 2 Timothy, that in a great house there are gold and silver and there are wood and something else. Some are made for dishonor while other is made for honor. We see the language of the text throughout scripture, family, and something we have to grasp with this concept that God allows certain things to happen in this world, in our life, but ultimately his plan is for the better of his vessels of honor. So I asked you the question this morning, what are you? Are you a vessel of honor or are you a vessel fitted for destruction? So go on out, music, please, Brandon. Let me end with these four quick points. Food for thought, a Christian perspective that we should have. Something to think about, softly, fear softly, please. Something to think about. Not all that is bad ends up bad. Not all that we see as evil and wrong ends up being evil and wrong. God has good in mind. We maybe in the beginning or some maybe some folks maybe see those who don't know scripture, don't understand Bible, don't understand, have that spirit that might see what happened to Jesus as a bad thing. But we know that it was for a greater good. Not everything family that starts off bad ends up bad. How many stories have you heard of someone, maybe uh, um, Johnny er Erica Sentata, swimmer, diving off the diving board, fell in, paralegic now, years back. She's all around the world teaching her story. It started off as a bad thing, but she was saying in her own words, it was the best thing that ever happened to my life because God has good as the end. Maybe you were sent to go to this place here. You don't want to go, but you felt you had to go. Or maybe your parents moved you from X, Y, Z when you was a kid. I don't want to go over there. My life is here. But you couldn't find out later in life, I'm glad we moved here because God had a good end in mind. It might have looked bad for you in the beginning. Oh, I got to go run this position. I got to go take this job here. I don't want this job here. But God, but now you see that it was good that I had this job now because God has good in mind. Brandon, find us just a piano. Just do the piano hymns, please. Second Christian point, second Christian perspective family we should take about everything, not just Zimmerman, Martin, that God is in the midst of it all. God is in the midst of it all. First position, we should understand that not everything that starts off bad or that is bad will end up bad. We understand that God has good in mind. Second point, family, is that God is in the midst of it all. This is the Christian perspective we should have, that God is in the midst of it all. And if we have that perspective, family, that God is in the midst of it all, then we should not have this whole worldly perspective, worldly slash believer perspective on what we may hear. Because if God's in the midst of it all, then we know God is working out a good for it. Man, I want to, oh, God. One last point. And then I want to just tell a quick story, a very familiar story we know, a Bible story. Number three, third Christian perspective we should have. Kind of alluded to this already, but let me say it again. Some things, some people are meant to be as they are. What do I mean by that? Okay. Be 
open. Be open. Remember I read in Romans 9, some are fitted for destruction. Some people out there are meant to do evil. They, they are who they are. This is scripture. I can send you verses, you'll see something. This is it's not me just coming to this. This is scripture. Some people, family, some things, some things, some situations, some scenarios, some people are meant to be as they are. It is what it is. But in that family, we, we look at, okay, then if that be the case, then God's plan then is really working out. Now, hear me give you a quick story, then be done. Story of Joseph. Joseph had a dream. And he went to his brothers. And Joseph had another dream. And he went to his family. The sun and the moon, mom and dad, and his seven brothers were all bow. What you do? You, you, you think you're going to be this and that and the other? We're going to bow down to you? So what they would do? They sold him into slavery. Now, mind you now, they wanted to kill him first. They wanted to kill him first. Let's kill this dreamer. Call himself a dreamer. Let's kill him with his mini coat, his multi-coat, with a multicolored coat. So, 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 okay, so the story goes on. So he's thrown into the pit, and he gets picked up by some people group, and they sell him to the Egyptians, right? Sell him to the Egyptians. Now let's fast forward maybe 10 or 12 chapters. So I think this starts in around chapter 32, something like that. Let's go to chapter 50. In between this time, family, bear in mind now, it looks bad for Joseph in the beginning, huh? Oh, God, why you got me here? God, why you got me in this prison? I'm in this pit. God, you told me I had a dream. How's this dream going to happen now if I'm stuck in this pit? You just sold me into slavery. Are they sold me into slavery? God, how's this dream going to come to pass? But God always have a good end in mind. Jesus. Y'all nod your head like I know how the story ends. That's why y'all excited. Brother Leslie got just grinning. Like, yeah, I know the end of the story. Remember my point, the Christian perspective. Not all that starts bad ends bad. And how the story of Joseph ends. There's a famine in the land. His brothers remember now Joseph made all, vice president if you will over the whole, out, the whole land of Egypt. House of Egypt. The Pharaoh. So he the man. He ain't like our vice president. Vice president he ain't got no power. <laughs> Back in those days if I say I make you this or that you can, you can have everything but don't touch my wife. That's, pretty, that's what the word says. Don't touch my wife. <laughs> So Joseph has all this power, family. And here comes a famine in the land. It started off bad. Not to mention he was thrown in prison. Thrown in prison. Joseph had a, had a rough life. Oh, oh, not to mention that the Pharaoh's wife was trying to get up at him. What else could I not to mention? Not to mention that, that, that when the prisoners left, when he's in prison, that they left and he thought they forgot about him. Come on. Joseph had it. Look, if I was just like, well, oh, Lord, fool me. Fool me. This is my lot in life. I'll be in prison the rest of my life. God, because that dream wasn't real. But then they remembered him. They brought him out. Let me fast forward again, yet again. Fast forward again. So here's a famine in the land. His brothers come to him. So there's a famine. Or his brothers come to the house of Pharaoh. They don't know it's him yet. They ask him for food. They want food. Because there's a famine. Joseph looks behind the curtain, looks from behind the curtain and sees, so that's my brothers. And because of his power, his authority in the land, uh, in, in the Egyptian, the house of Pharaoh, he has now the permission to send food down to where he's from, his father, Jacob. And when his brothers recognize, when he comes out and, and, and now they recognize each other, like, oh, wow, you this, this is my brother Joseph. He says this very key verse. What you meant for evil, God meant it for my good. Understand this phrase meant, family. It is not, remember, God knows the end from the bu. So it does not, it didn't happen during the course of this process. God already laid it out that way. What you meant for evil, what looks like evil out there to us, and it is in its own right, God means it for our good good. The supremacy of the glory of God and the plan of God. God says 
my plan, my counsel will stand. No matter what man says, no matter what man tries to do, no matter how man might try to circumvent the system, my plan will stand because I am supreme. I am the greatest. I am the one true living God. There is none other like me. Try what you want. Try the government. Try the bottle. Try whatever you want. You will still come to find out there is nobody greater than God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. God, I ask that you would deepen this word in their hearts, God, that they can, that we all can leave here with a, a, a healthy and Christian perspective on what we see happen around us, God. Knowing now that your plan is supreme and knowing now, God, that you have good as the intended end. So, God, we thank you for your word this morning and visiting with us sending us your spirit that we can receive what you have given us. So God, be pleased with us. And God, bestow upon us blessings and favor that you and all things, God,